Well, thank you very much. And before I begin a discussion of some of the potential policy implications, I just want to take a moment to thank Emily and to thank Hilton uh, for this spectacular research. Uh, I mean, it's amazing. Let's give her another round of applause. <laughs> I mean, um, from my point of view, what we have before us is the equivalent of what the Midwest study was for youth aging out of foster care. Um, and those of us who are not researchers, but rather advocates, often have a quite thin base of evidence that we stretch to the max, shall we say, sometimes perhaps farther than we should. Um, but now we really have the evidence. We know what is going on. And the question before us is, what can we do? Um, and so my role today is just to, to pose some ideas um, and really you know, open a conversation about what our California and federal child welfare community can do now that we have this extremely uh, compelling evidence. Um, and so hopefully this will be the beginning of a real movement, a seismic shift in how we think about young parents in foster care. That this is, this is ground zero, this is day one. This study is where it begins. We will look back and know that with this evidence, we took it as far as we could take it and that the world was forever changed. Um, so little grandiose there, but I think that uh, we have some ambitious people in the room and I think if we really put our priority on this, we can, we can look back and see that uh, our practice and our policies change significantly. And the first one I want to start with is, is probably the most obvious, and yet sometimes the most obvious things are where we need to start, which is really improving access to pregnancy prevention services for children and youth in foster care. You know, we have the evidence by age 21, one in three young people in foster care will give birth to a child. And what are we currently doing as a state to prevent that? Now the truth is there are many fabulous pockets of, of wonderful practice, many of which are right here in Los Angeles County, really LA County and many of the people in the room, you are leading the charge to change this. But as a system, we do not have anything in statute that guarantees access to pregnancy prevention. Um, and so what I really liken this to is if you ever ask someone whose job is it, who will get in trouble if the issue of pregnancy prevention is not raised with a young person in care, you get a million different answers. And I only know this because I've asked it a million times. You'll hear a foster parent. You'll hear the county social worker. You'll hear that's a religious matter, your faith community. Um, you hear a million different answers, but there's a total lack of clarity. And until we know exactly who is on the hook for raising these issues, if not necessarily providing them, at least referring to them, we're not going to make a significant change. Um, and this was attempted this year in SB 528, uh, Senator Leland Yee's bill uh, that our organization co-sponsored with Public Council, uh, the Alliance for Children's Rights, and Children's Law Center, I'm sorry, I, you know, Leslie's in here. Um, and uh, this was a provision we attempted to have uh, integrated into the law. And unfortunately, it was not successful. It was a little bit too much, a little bit too early, frankly. We didn't have this evidence. We were leaning on Illinois data, which was similar but different. We are very, very different states. Um, and now it's time to turn back and say, okay, uh, we have the evidence. We know that these young people um, are having uh, children at much higher rates um, than the general population, and what are we going to do about it? I think it's really important to, to say, though, that where this comes from, from my point of view, is the radical transformation we've had in the demographics of foster care, not just in California, but nationally. The idea of pregnancy prevention for kids in foster care, in some ways our self-concept is still small children. And while we've had a traumatic reduction in caseload, the proportion that are adolescents has increased considerably. And so we've had this seismic change in the demographics of foster care. And really this is an example of our practice not quite keeping pace. And so two uh, approaches that are being considered 
One is one that the John Burton Foundation hopes to work with the National Campaign and the other sponsors of SB 528 on an approach uh, that the National Campaign piloted. What they did is together with APHSA, they invited four states and one county, Alameda County in uh, California, to participate in a year-long effort to integrate an evidence-based pregnancy prevention curriculum into their child welfare practice. And Katie is gonna talk more about that, but our work we want to uh, encourage in California is to reproduce that effort here in California um, to try and really bring these pregnancy prevention services in a very organic way to the counties we know that we have 58 counties, but the, the reality is they're very different. Take the time, support them in this effort, evaluate it, and then potentially, with information from that evaluation, evaluation revisit the option of uh, including it as a requirement. Um, so that is, that is kind of one, I think, implication is we can no longer um, look away from the fact that one in three young people will be um, will be young parents by the time they turn 21. So the second, the second, I think, very serious implication, in maybe some ways even more serious implication, is better supporting our young people who become parents in foster care. Um, and we know uh, from Emily's data that those individuals, the rate of child maltreatment is two to three times higher. Um, and again, what is really complicating about this is exactly where Emily mentioned. It's a very rare event. It's, it's, higher, it's a higher incidence than in the general population. But if you're a child welfare worker, you're not going to experience this all the time. It's very rare. And anything a person only does once a year or maybe once every 18 months or once every 36 months, we're not that great at. So the challenge is, you know, these young parents, in some ways, are needles within our child welfare haystack. And how do we organize a system of care that can find these needles and support them as they become young parents? You know, for me, this is one of the most amazing opportunities of extended foster care. We actually have a great rationale for supporting these young parents. They're in the care and custody voluntarily of our child welfare system. So we actually have a rationale for supporting them and setting them up to be successful parents. Um, in the past, they would have aged out at 18 and they probably would have had a kid before 21. But now we have a social service system that can really rally around them. And that is what is happening in Los Angeles. And we have two of the preeminent practitioners of this approach right here with us, Barbara Fasher and Mara Ziegler. And um, this is a, called the pregnant, it's called the PPT conference. We really have to rename it because the word teen is in it and we no longer are, are using this approach just for teens. Um, but it is an approach where when a young person um, is pregnant, um, a whole system of consultation is brought around them in the form of a specialized conference. Um, to ensure that they're accessing all of the services that are available in the maternal uh, health world, such as the nurse family partnership. And again, these are, you know, if you work every day with parenting youth, you know about all these. But the incidence of, of parenting youth in foster care is very rare. And so these specialized conferences bring this specialized information to bear for these young people and really support them through the birth of their child, securing child care, um, ensuring that their placement is secure so that there's not uh, placement instability when there doesn't need to be, and really follows them throughout the course um, of their life as a young child. And so this really deserves a tremendous acknowledgement that LA has embraced this approach. It's not just a practice happening, it's formal county policy. It's something we need to hold up for the rest of the state to educate them about and also to kind of codify because while Los Angeles County took the initiative to begin this practice, other counties may need a little bit more of a roadmap. And so we're very much hoping to work together to build that roadmap so that other counties who may not have, uh, may have not given this as much consideration can jump into it and build off all of the lessons that Los Angeles County has already uh, learned. And Children's Law Center of California recently did an evaluation because we want to be evidence-based. And they did a case file review of, I think it was like 150, maybe 200 young people who had participated in this. 
followed them over a period of time and found of the identified goals that they established um, on a range of criteria, they were in fact meeting those goals. Um, and so it's exciting to see an approach. Um, it doesn't have near the evidence base that we heard about today, but it's a budding evidence base. It's something we can do. Um, and so working together again to think, how can we hold up this very strong practice, this exciting practice that is beginning to make a difference in the lives of, of parenting youth in foster care. A second uh, approach that LA is taking, which is also fabulous, which would be great to see the other 57 counties take, which is entering into a memorandum of understanding with the Nurse Family Partnership. So, I mean, the Nurse Family Partnership is really the gold standard in prenatal evidence-based uh, intervention. And uh, there's such a need, as we heard about from the evidence today, I think the mistake is sometimes when we talk about these, uh, the policy implications, it doesn't have to be the child welfare system that foots the bill. It's also about leveraging other funds. And the Nurse Family Partnership is a great example of a fully federally funded program that is there and ready to assist. But it takes that partnership for the child welfare agency to reach out and make that connection and for the training to occur at the local level so that when a young person becomes pregnant, that referral is made on a very timely basis. The inclusion of that in the Foster Care Bill of Rights, the right to receive uh, information about uh, sexual development and reproductive health uh, was included in that. And now we, now we have to make that right something with some legs uh, to get it out there into the field so that young people in foster care, um, you know, actually get that information. So a next area um, that again, I think all of this information dovetails into, particularly what you're saying, Mara, about an opportunity for future, is access to high quality, affordable child care. Um, that we really have no coherent approach to provide child care for the children of youth in foster care. Um, and the amount of data that's available is extremely limited, but of the data that is, there's a report called the SOC 405E that tracks youth who age out of care. Um, and in the most recent completed year, only 4% of youth who were custodial parents had either received or had even applied for subsidized child care. Um, and what we have here is this patchwork of very creative local workarounds. Uh, we talked to a lot of different counties in the course of SB 528 about what they do. Some counties are extremely effective in kind of working the system and getting those kids care. Others are terrible. In fact, we had one, uh, one um, lobby day in Sacramento where we had all these young people scheduled to come up and speak to legislators and really share the reality of what it is to be a young parent in foster care. And they had canceled because they couldn't get child care. It really brought the issue home to our legislative team. And I couldn't help but ask the uh, group home where they were living. I'm like, what are they doing? They're like, they're in a, in kind of a distance learning kind of charter school. And they're with their kids all the time. And uh, which is, again, um, if that is a choice and maybe that is the appropriate thing or a right thing, but it's certainly not the only option we want to provide for young parents. And so the question is, um, how do we do it? How do we go about doing this? Um, how do we think about it? Because we have a whole very elaborate system of subsidized child care, which is largest, largely focused on CalWORKs or welfare recipients. Um, and what young people in foster care have is they can get in line after all the CalWORKs recipients have their child care with the low income population. So we made an extremely modest effort in SB 528 to kind of inch these young people forward in the line a little bit and really realized we had not done our homework about the dynamics around subsidized child care, um, that we have lost hundreds and thousands of slots of subsidized child care. And when you come to the party and say, oh, we want our young people up a little bit farther, that does not work. Um, and in fact, we, what we heard more than anything, including from members of the legislature and key committee personnel, is why are we putting these young people in the same queue as the rest of the California population? These are children who have been removed from their, from their parents due to maltreatment. They're in the care and custody of our child welfare system. Why would we 
uh, why wouldn't we have some type of dedicated approach to their needs? And so that's a conversation that's currently underway. I mean, the first thing we all see is like dollar bills above our heads. Um, so we have to really think about a smart way to do this. Um, but one unintended consequence of kind of opening this umbrella of foster care for older youth, but without offering any uh, reliable child care is that they are not able at times to access extended care. Uh, extended care requires young people to, to participate in one, five, one of five participation conditions. And being the parent of a young child in your home is not one of them. You don't get a, a pass for that. Um, in fact, uh, not at all. And so without access to child care, how are they supposed to work? How are they supposed to be in school? How are they supposed to be doing what the federal government wants these young people to do, it put in its participation conditions and as we've implemented it here in California. So what they're doing instead is they're going on to CalWORKs and they're beginning their CalWORKs clock. You know, um, so that is not what we want. We want while, they're, while they have the fabulous opportunity be, to be in, you know, a very strong system of care, our child welfare system, to maximize that opportunity and hopefully, with the right support, may not need to go on to CalWORKs at 21. But if they do, their CalWORKs clock can start at age 21 instead of 18. So this is a real conversation. I would not pretend to have the solution here, but I hope this can be the beginning of a conversation where we weigh different approaches to providing childcare to this group um, who very, very desperately need it and find a way to do something other than you know what our current approach is to put them in um, in competition with a large and ever-growing uh, group of people who need, of low-income individuals who need, who need uh, subsidized child care. Um, so the, the next approach, I think the policy implication, and I think this is what is so important about your study, Emily, is you don't come at it from a child welfare perspective, you also come, you know, it's really the population. And it looks at how many young people became pregnant with just an allegation of maltreatment that was never substantiated. Um, however, so, so it really speaks to the need to also sustain our general network of reproductive health uh, services in California. Unfortunately, we're going in the exact opposite direction. We've had over a 70% cut in the public programs that provide reproductive health education to the general popul population of adolescents since 2008. So this is not the right direction, this is the wrong direction. And you know, uh, those programs have been a very instrumental in having California's teen birth rate reduced to the level uh, that it has. And in fact, our teen birth rate is even lower than, than the national. And so we have to ask ourselves, what is the implication of this massive divestment in uh, the general uh, uh, reproductive health programs for teens? Um, so we, I think that's a very real answer. I mean, it's a real question that we need to pose to our elected officials um, and to bring this kind of evidence to bear that, this, that the pregnancy prevention services that California has invested in are not just a nice to have, they're actually preventing child maltreatment and they're an integral part of what our state needs to do uh, to, to move that agenda forward. Um, and, and in the little policy and practice memo, there's a little more facts and figures about how, how many uh, fewer young people are served. It's actually a 93% reduction in the number of adolescents who receive these services. Um, the last two are a little bit out there, but you know, I wanted to, you know, I got my creativity going and thought, why not? Um, so one is differential response. So you know, we know there are hundreds and thousands of allegations, uh, over 400, almost 500,000 allegations of child maltreatment every year in California. And we know the vast majority are not substantiated. And through the system of differential response we have in counties, we know that many of those cases uh, where they're it seems like the, the family could receive support, um, should receive it through being referred to community-based services. And yet in that collection of services, do we ask, is there an adolescent in the home and do they have access to these types of supports to prevent unintended pregnancy? Again, it's a bit of a, um, we think about the parent and we think in our mind's eye kind of as a small child. But given that we know this heightened risk of pregnancy and the heightened risk of maltreatment, 
among parents who were even just, didn't even have a substantiated allegation of maltreatment. It really raises the question about whether in our basket of services we offer through differential response, we could also add this. And the last, uh, I think, policy implication is, you know, California has done a lot to think about the needs of uh, parenting youth in foster care. And I think one of the most promising practices is the whole family foster home. Um, and this is a, an approach that is really intended to support young people who are young parents in foster care. Um, but it really hasn't taken off. And we don't know exactly why. Um, there are a lot of competing theories. And I think a very interesting piece of research that could be done is why is there such uneven implementation of whole family foster homes? It is a great approach, um, but we have had very limited implementation. And so in some ways, rather than going and creating the next thing, let's go back to the whole family foster home. Let's do some research about why it hasn't taken flight to the extent that it could in some parts of the state. And let's investigate whether we should we should correct whatever, maybe it's just a little bit of tweaking to the approach. It may not be a legislative fix, it may be more of a practice fix. We may, we may hear it's not 16 hours, we should bring it down to 10. But whatever it is, let's not give up on the whole foster family home, which has a tremendous amount of potential to really wrap services around that young people and support them as young parents. I mean, being the parent of a young child is difficult no matter what the age, but for these young parents, without families of their own, to guide them through those, uh, through those early years as a parent, it's extremely challenging. But we wanna go from pockets of practice, and LA is one big pocket, so it's not really fair to call it pocket, it's more like a pant a of practice, but to a durable, reliable system of care where you have a guarantee if you're, you know, that's the challenge. And that's really the challenge to a bit, to, to somewhat of an extent under realignment. You know, as we know, child welfare, its system has been realigned and it's given counties in some ways a new opportunity to envision these kind of services. And that is exciting, I think that's the real upside. But we still need to know that if you're a pregnant and parenting youth in Yolo, San Bernardino, Fresno, LA, Alameda, Del Norte, that you can get a reliable uh, approach that, that recognizes the real underlying, I keep pointing to blank screens, but <laughs> real underlying risks. Um, of being a young parent and that we wrap everything we can around them. I mean, to me, the opportunity here is really exciting. There seems to be uh, a huge upside uh, to approaching these young people and addressing uh, the maltreatment that they're experiencing.